Professor Wenda Reddy from Bly, University of Copenhagen. quite an introduction, uh, Morten. Thank you very much. <laughs> you know, the, the whole idea happened uh, actually about a month ago then, uh, that we were having actually a cup of coffee in the, in the kitchen at our uh, university and then uh, we had a discussion about the roasting and started some ideas about maybe oxygen was maybe more important than we thought and then we dragged a little bit on and I must also say that uh, Morten said that I received uh, the slides on Thursday, but it was not Thursday last week, it was actually yesterday. So. <laughs> so we, we are really in a process of uh, trying to develop some ideas and, and also some, uh, some more systematic studies <coughs> on, uh, on coffee roasting and, and flavor formation. So, um, but uh, today for my talk, uh, I just need to, um, well, I, I have actually two things with me. One thing is more on the generic ideas behind uh, how flavors are developed in roasting of coffee. Uh, and what kind of components uh, are formed uh, and a little bit on some of the mechanisms. But of course, the time is very limited, so I just made a selection of some, uh, some, some, some materials. And, and then uh, there was this question on this uh, lowering smart roasting, where you uh, sort of uh, have a, a closed system where, where you recirculate the air and therefore get maybe some different reaction conditions. And I have a few things on that. And then uh, I also have, um, uh, and then maybe I can show that on the next slide actually. Uh, I can also, uh, I have also a little bit more about coffee tasting because I saw in your program that you're going to do a lot of cupping and a lot of things and uh, I just also want to give you a little bit of uh, background actually that when we're talking about uh, coffee flavor and, and roasting, that's one aspect. But in fact, uh, many of the components that are formed are not necessarily so stable. And you know that when you uh, have coffee prepared after a while, the, the, the flavor changes. But I also have some arguments actually that uh, uh, the coffee flavor is not only what's in the bean, but it's uh, not even what's in the cup, but sometimes it's actually generated when we are drinking uh, coffee in the mouth. Uh, so I have also some arguments just to show you uh, uh, also a little bit more the broader aspect of uh, coffee flavor. So um, let's just look a little bit at, um, uh, and this is also what uh, Morton uh, showed. Look a little bit at the composition of, uh, of coffee beans. Uh, and I extended the slide of Morton uh, by showing uh, two varieties uh, of coffee beans before and after roasting. So you can actually here see a little bit what are actually the changing changes happening when, uh, when one is roasting uh, coffee. And uh, what, what really uh, strikes me is when you look at this slide that uh, when we, when we have, of course, a lot of polysaccharides, and that's what Morton also explained, the cellulose uh, and, and other uh, supers uh, present. Uh, but you can see really after roasting, uh, uh, the, the quantity or the, the, the percentage present in the bean is, uh, is uh, reduced. So uh, roasting really does something with the, uh, with the sugars. Uh, sucrose uh, is disappearing completely. Uh, reducing sugars uh, are, are given here, but What's more important here is to uh, go into the proteins. Uh, you see the, uh, a drop in proteins, we see a drop in uh, amino acids. Uh, and, and so when I look at this uh, table, several components are relatively stable, but especially when you look at uh, the sugars, the amino acids, the proteins, uh, they are uh, uh, reducing in the amount uh, during roasting. And that's of course indicating very strongly that something is happening between maybe these molecules, and that's why the Meyer reaction is so important. Uh, and I'll come back to that. Uh, um, what also I think is important just to mention is that when we look at lipids uh, in coffee bean, that's actually quite high. I think the, the percentage of lipids uh, is here, it's about, what do we see, 11, uh, 16, 17 percent. So that's quite a high uh, a, a lipid uh, content, but it doesn't seem to, uh, to change too much. But on the other hand, uh, I'm also uh, doubting a little bit, do lipids still play a role? Because quantitatively, they are quite high in, in, in the bean. So, so there must be uh, some contribution somewhere along the way. 
Um, so uh, when, when I just looked a little bit into the, the literature, then uh, there was a very good uh, report uh, made in uh, 2000 uh, by a PhD student at the Technical University in Zurich. And he made a very nice uh, overview uh, looking at a lot of uh, articles and putting all the components together that people believe they were sort of impacting uh, the coffee flavor. So uh, you can call them the character impact uh, compounds. So the components that uh, are in such a high level uh, present in the beans that they actually uh, are expected to contribute uh, to the flavor. And of course, uh, it will depend very much on how you do the roasting. Uh, the, the, the ratio of these components change. So you will see that in certain kind of coffees, uh, particular components are more important than in other kinds of coffees. But just this gives you sort of an uh, overview of uh, the components that people have identified, so like, well, this, these ones we really should give some uh, more attention. And what strikes me is that when you look at coffee flavor uh, and, and look at the volatiles that are known in, in coffee, that is uh, really uh, many, many hundreds of uh, components that are known. Uh, but when you look at this list, it's only, uh, yeah, you can say, a, a few handfuls of components that, that really uh, seems to have an impact. And these are the volatile components. So these are the components that are contributing to the, uh, you can say, the aroma properties or the flavor properties of coffee. They are not the uh, uh, non-volatile components because, of course, the non-volatile components, if you think about caffeine and other uh, kind of components, they contribute often to bitterness. Now, one thing I should mention here as well is that some of these components actually, be, even though they are volatile, they actually, uh, in some coffees, can be at such high level that they actually also can contribute to bitterness. Some of the pyrazines, for instance, they have uh, bitter uh, tasting properties. So, so the bitterness aspect, that could, that could be also many, uh, many components as well. Now, when, when we look a little bit at these components, they say, okay, uh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, nice names. Uh, uh, you don't maybe know so much about, maybe some of you do. Uh, but there is some, some, some sort of commonality. You have here a group of components that uh, contain sulfur, uh, and sulfur uh, that can only come from two uh, amino acids. Uh, we have the methionine and uh, you have the cysteine, uh, and then you have uh, some, some peptides uh, uh, from uh, cysteine, uh, uh, but, but still uh, it's only two amino acids that contribute to, and if you look at the components of uh, methionyl, that's uh, stracker aldehyde uh, of the, uh, the methionine. So that's uh, really, we can see a link towards a particular amino acid. Whereas if you look at the other components here, uh, it's probably somewhere uh, is a breakdown of the cysteine, and cysteine can release uh, H2S, and that is a very nice uh, reactive substrate into the Maillard reaction, and that can lead uh, to the formation of, of these kind of components. So, so there we understand a little bit. When we look a little bit on this side here, we have some of the uh, furanol and, and related components, and they are also very typical uh, components to, that, uh, that come, you can say, almost directly from the sugar part in, uh, in the Maillard reaction. Then we have uh, some other uh, components here, the, the uh, Strike all aldehydes uh, here, the, the two, three methyl uh, butanols. Uh, we have some of the acids, uh, and then we have also some uh, 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 di diketones. Um, and and these, these components, uh, they also they are coming from super breakdown part. So you can say this is coming from my reaction, this is coming from my reactions, and related strike degradation, this is coming from my reactions. Then we have uh, the pyrazines. Uh, and they are quantitatively quite important, I think, in, uh, in coffee. Uh, at least very easily you'll find them always. I always say to a student, if you analyze something like coffee, you have to find pyrazines, otherwise your analytical method doesn't, is not uh, okay. Uh, they must be there somehow. Otherwise you cannot, with, with roasting, you always see that they, they, they just pop up very easily. Uh, but there's only a few of them that seem to be really having impact. And uh, this is a methoxypyrazine, it's a bit special because this is not normally pyrazines, they contribute to the roasted uh, and, and the uh, bitter and the burnt uh, type of flavors. But the methoxypyrazine here uh, could be also adding more to the green bean uh, notes that can be observed in coffee. So this is a, a slightly different pyrazine and this is uh, not necessarily through uh, Maillard reaction, whereas the other ones, they are uh, definitely uh, as a pathway through the Maillard reaction. So, so um, and then we have, uh, so, then we have, you can say many of these components, it's all Maillard reactions, but then we have some other ones, uh, for instance here the breakdown from the, uh, um, uh, for instance, uh, vitamin uh, E, uh, you have uh, some of the carotenoids uh, that can give, uh, for instance, beta-dominisone. Uh, 
I don't know if you know the, the, the odor of uh, Douglas Stone, but that has sort of a cooked apple uh, kind of a flavor note, and it often pops out as, a, as an important uh, uh, component in, uh, in coffee, but actually also in other foods. And then we have the fen yeah, phenylalanine, and then uh, several other phenols, um, and uh, they, they uh, contribute uh, to uh, mainly the, uh, the smoky uh, notes and some of the uh, yeah, termic notes, so, you know, so it's really good. Uh, we, some people may describe it shoe polish or something like that. That's also why I brought the phenol, so maybe expensive whiskies. Uh, so, but uh, th these components also, they, they, they are present, but they are not from the mayor, actually. They are coming from other parts. I'll show you that in a moment. So, so, so this was actually quite interesting because this is based on a lot of studies. This, uh, I did not show all the references here, but so I really a lot of studies, and then they cooked it into this table. And I think this is quite nice. There's not so many components. We see a lot of components come from the mayor reaction. Uh, but there's also some other components from, from other, para, uh, other reactions in the, in the roasting that, uh, that also contribute to coffee flavor. <coughs> so if you look at uh, uh, another study, and in fact, if you look at this list of components, you see many of the components that are actually similar as in the, in the previous title, but this is only for, from a particular study, but they were comparing the Arabica and the Robusta uh, uh, roasted coffees. And, uh, and here was uh, again a, a list of the components that uh, that were present above their sensory threshold, and uh, I I modified it a little bit to give sort of an in, uh, in index of uh, impact. And the highest number here they have the highest uh, impact, and the lowest number have the lower impact. So they they are just present uh, just about ten times above their uh, threshold. And here we're talking about uh, that these components is a log value, so they are almost. Uh, uh, 100,000 to, to a million times above the threshold. So, 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 so they, they are really, uh, you could say, they should have uh, a impact. Uh, so if you look at uh, this list, you see the Demnazone, the Fuvrile, uh, Thiol, very high up the list. And of course, we can say like, well, coffee, roasted coffee, when you think about Arabica and Rebuca, it doesn't really taste of any uh, uh, cooked apples. Uh, it's not really, uh, but you, you have to see this component, uh, this is in an isolated state, but in the mixture, it will probably uh, add something to the body of the uh, of the coffee. So it's not necessarily that it's really transparent, but it's sort of blended into the mix of all the other uh, components. But uh, fuvrol fuvrol uh, thiol that really pops out uh, again as a very important uh, impact uh, component for roasted coffee. Um, now you can go through uh, through down the list, and there's many of the components that I ju just mentioned before, uh, uh, and. What I would like, to, would like to stress is just a, a little bit on the differences between the uh, Arabica and then the Robusta, where you can see uh, on the methoxypyrazine, which has the green bean note, that's maybe more characteristic, characteristic in the Arabica. And then uh, you can see uh, some of the phenols, uh, the vanillin, uh, the, the ethyl glycol and the vinyl uh, glycol, all, they, they, they are present in lower quantity. So if, when you think about it, this more smoky uh, kind of notes, then that uh, would be an argument to say that, okay, the, the Robusta should be maybe more characteristic in that than the uh, Arabica uh, coffee. So, so this is sort of uh, the components that people have found in the coffee. And I, I just uh, would like to group them uh, more in, the, in an overall view of like how, how, uh, how, how should we look at the roasting in terms of um, all the kind of reactions that are known that is happening uh, uh, during the roasting of the coffee. And we have, of course, the sugars as precursors. And when you're looking at the uh, heating of sugars, uh, uh, as Morton also indicated, they can, uh, they can react, but they can also uh, fragment and, and uh, react by themselves. So you can... Uh,